Well, this morning we begin the last great section of Romans. Paul's letter to the church at Rome can be divided into five sections, and each of these sections can be characterized by a key word that summarizes the contents of the five sections. The words are sin, salvation, sanctification, sovereignty, and service. And this morning we begin the very practical part of the book of Romans that deals with our service to God, how we should live our lives in light of all that Christ has done for us in Jesus Christ. This section deals with the the basics of Christian living. The first four sections of Romans deal with doctrine. This last section deals with how we're to behave as Christians. This is Paul's usual pattern in almost all of his letters. First, he teaches us correct doctrine what to believe. Then he shows us how to apply that doctrine to live an abundant Christian life. So Paul begins Romans 12. As he begins Romans 12, the first thing he says is, therefore I urge you. Now one of the principles of good scriptural interpretation is whenever you see the word therefore, you need to look and see what is it there for. Paul is saying in the Romans 12, therefore, that in light of everything that we've talked about up to this point, in light of all that God has done for us by His grace through Jesus Christ, this then is the way that we should live our lives. There are four great therefores in the book of Romans, and every time you see a therefore, Paul is signaling that he's beginning a new topic. First in Romans 3.20, there's the therefore of sin. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. We're all sinners outside of Jesus Christ. Second, in Romans 5.1, there's the therefore of salvation. Paul writes, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He says we've been justified, we've been made right with God, we've been saved by our faith in Jesus Christ. Third, in Romans 8, we find that therefore of security, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And fourth, in Romans 12, 1 and 2, there's the therefore of service. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual worship. Romans 12, 1 and 2 are two of the greatest verses in the Bible. The point Paul is making is that the true test of my beliefs is behavior. I've told you that before. You know, it bothers some people that the Bible says we're saved by faith through grace, but every time judgment's talked about, it talks about our works. It's not that we're saved by works, but as I've told you before, if I stand up here and say, the building is on fire, Now, if you don't think, you you know I'm just being rhetorical, but if you believe that, if you believe I'm sincere, you jump up and you run out of the building. You see, I don't have to quiz you on, do you believe me? Do you have any confidence in me? Because if you believe me, well, it's the same way with the Word of God. And so Paul is telling us, you know, that the true test of the beliefs that we have is our behavior. Now, Paul is going to get very practical here, and as he gets practical, he starts with our relationships. This week we're going to talk about our relationship with God, but in succeeding weeks as we look at the coming chapters, he talks about our relationship to the world, to the church, to each other, to our our enemies, to the government, to those who disagree with us. Being a genuine Christian means you take your doctrine and you put it into practice in the real world. That's what Paul's going to tell us how to do in this last uh, last section of Romans. Paul tells us at the beginning of Romans 12 that if we will offer our lives to God and stop conforming to the values of this world, we will be able to find God's good, pleasing, and perfect will for our lives. I think one of the biggest things that many Christians want to know is, God, what is your will for my life? Now, some of you, as soon as I say this, you say, well, I wish I'd heard this in my 20s, but I'm 80 years old now. It's too late for me. Well, it's not. Whether you are 8 or 88 or 108, if you want the rest of your life to be the best of your life, you want to find God's will because it's good and it's pleasing. Because if you want to find the best life, that's what God has willed for you. So how do we discover God's will for your life? Well, there's no magic formula. God's will is not a formula. 
It's not just a feeling, but there are three very powerful principles that Paul outlines that explain what God's will for our life is. First is the principle of dedication. Verse 1, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercies, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual worship. Paul is saying to us, commit your life totally to Christ. The secret to knowing God's will is being willing in advance to do whatever God wants you to do, even before you know what it is. Most people have the attitude, God, you show me what your will is, and then after I know your will, I'll decide if I want to do it. Well, that, that doesn't ever work. You'll never know God's will for your life that way. If you want to know God's will, you have to decide, because I know that God loves me, that He only wants the best for my life. He loved me enough to come and die for me. I'm committed to doing and being and going wherever God leads. In a large black church in Philadelphia, the choir started low and slow, just the way a good bright black preacher preaches. He starts low and slow, and then he turns on the gas as he gets near the end. <laughs> but the, uh, the choir started singing softly, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, yes, yes. And it grew to a great crescendo. And then the pastor gets up and he starts with a prayer, Lord, you have already heard our answer. Now tell us what you want us to do. That's the attitude of faith, and that's the attitude God wants us to have. I'm willing to do your will, whatever it is, Lord, even before I know what it is. To be totally dedicated to God means you say yes to Him for your life, your business, your home, your family, everything. What's the reason Paul gives that we should show such dedication to God? He says, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercies. Why should I dedicate myself to God? Paul says, because of all that God has done for us, all of His mercies. What are His mercies? Well, that's what he talks about. Paul's covered that in Romans 4-8. through 8. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. When Christ died for us and God saved us, not because we deserve it, but out of His great grace and mercy, and He promises to be with us and to be present, never leave us or forsake us, and then when life is over, to take us to be with Him eternally. And Paul says, in light of all this, surely we ought to be willing to give our lives in return for Him. The starting point is to dedicate our lives to God. Now, there are three characteristics of true Christian dedication. First, it's voluntary. Paul says, offer your bodies. Offer means to voluntarily commit. Paul's saying, make a decisive dedication of your body. Now, the word that he uses here is the same word in Greek you would use to make a reservation for a table in a restaurant. When you do that, a table is set aside for your benefit. Nobody else can use the table. Well, Paul says, put a reservation card on your life. God, my life is reserved for you. My life, my time, my money, all that I am, all that I have, I'm com it, it all completely belongs to you. And you do that voluntarily. Second, true dedication is practical. He says, offer your bodies. Why would God want your body? Why does God say, off, why doesn't God say, uh, say, well, offer your soul or your spirit? He says bodies because if God owns your body, he owns you. Have you ever heard someone say, I can't make it to the meeting tonight, but I'll be there with you in spirit? Well, that's a great sentiment, but it's practically worthless. Your spirit doesn't do anything unless your body is there. It's one thing to say, you know, that you're going to give your money to missions. It's another thing to say, I'm going to give my body and go spend two weeks on the mission field. When you give your body, it means you're giving yourself. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 says your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. How do you know if you've dedicated your body to God? Well, when God shows you a need, you immediately go to meet that need, even if it isn't convenient. The third characteristic of, of true Christian dedication is it's complete. Offer your bodies, he says, as a living sacrifice. You may have heard the old story of the pig and chicken that were asked to help with the annual community ham and egg breakfast. The pig was somewhat hesitant, and the chicken asked why. The pig responded, all, uh, responded, all they want from you is a contribution. For me, this requires a total sacrifice. 
Sacrifice means total, it's complete, it's unconditional. The starting point for knowing God's will is complete dedication. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, usually when we think of sacrifice, we think of something dead. But this says living sacrifice. There's one problem with the living sacrifice, and that is it can crawl off the altar. That's why it's got to be a daily sacrifice. A lot of us come to church and we commit ourselves on Sunday, and then on Monday we crawl off the altar. We sing Onward Christian Soldiers on Sunday, and then on Monday we go AWOL. Note the Bible says this complete commitment of our lives to God is holy and pleasing to God. In Greek, it literally says well-pleasing to God, which means it makes God happy when we commit ourselves to Him. When you do this, Paul says it's your spiritual worship. You know, worship is not supposed to be something you just do on Sundays. Worship is what you do with your whole life as you use every moment of every day for Him, whether you're mopping the floor for your family or visiting a sick person in the hospital. Anytime you make a total commitment of your life to God, then every action you take becomes an act of worship as you're doing everything for the glory of God and in the service of Him and in the service of others. Paul says we can be living in constant worship of God when we've dedicated all of our lives to Him. So the first principle for knowing God's will for your life is the principle of dedication. Offer yourself totally and completely to God. Paul shows us the second principle as he writes, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. One of the reasons we're not dedicated to the Lord is because we're dedicated to the world and its values. So Paul introduces the principle of insulation. Now, Paul isn't talking about insulating or separating ourselves from the people around us in the world. We can't bring them the good news of Jesus Christ if we do that. Paul's talking about insulating ourselves, separating ourselves from the world's distorted value system. He's saying, don't be caught up in the spirit of the age. It's all about me. He who dies with the most toys wins. Happiness comes from having more things. I have to look out for number one. Those are the, this, that's the distorted value system of the world that leads only ultimately to unhappiness and separation from God and others and ultimately from everything that's good. Don't adopt the world's philosophy. Don't conform your life to the warped perspective of the world. J.B. Phillips, the great Greek New Testament scholar who, who made the Phillips translation of the Bible, translates this verse, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. <coughs> Have you ever felt pressured by the world to conform? You go, well, this is what everybody's doing. Everybody thinks this is okay to do now. In a Peanuts comic strip, Charlie Brown says, I can re resist any pressure except peer. How can a Christian relate to the world when he's, when he's living in the world, but he's not supposed to be of the world? Well, the Christian's relationship to the world is not supposed to be isolation, and it's not supposed to be imitation. It's all about insulation. Most Christians go to one of two extremes when it comes to relating to the world. Some Christians are isolationists. I don't want to have anything to do with this evil world, therefore I won't go to movies, I'm not going to watch television, I won't dress like the world does. The Amish are an extreme example of the isolationist approach. God doesn't want you to go into a monastery to escape the world. We have to be out in the world if we're going to reach people with the message of Jesus Christ. At the other extreme, there are Christians who imitate the world. You can't tell them from their non-Christian neighbors. I just want to fit in. Whatever the world does, I'll do it too so I don't stand out. But the Bible says don't imitate the world's actions and values. We're called to be salt and light in the world, showing people by our lives and our words that there's a better way to live, God's way. It's not isolation or imitation. It's supposed to be insulation. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I like to go deep sea fishing, and I love seafood. When I go deep sea fishing and bring a fish home, I grill it or I pan fry it, and I always have to put salt on it. Fish that have lived their entire lives in salt water are bland if you don't put salt on them. Isn't that amazing? The fish drinks in salt water, it lives in salt water, but it isn't salty. 
Now, if God can keep a fish in salt water all of its life and not let the salt penetrate and permeate its body, God can keep the Christian in a non-Christian world pure. That's insulation. Paul is saying culture is, to is a totally unreliable source for getting guidance for your life. Don't be conformed to this world. If everybody else is doing it, it must be okay. No, most people just follow the crowd. They don't think for themselves. They just want to conform to what everyone else is saying and doing and so, so they don't stick out. It's the case of the blind leading the blind and often everyone ends up going over the cliff. Every year, magazines like U.S. News and World Report put out lists that tell us what's in and what's out. For a lot of people, that's like their Bible. They buy their clothes, their sunglasses, their cars based on what's in. They remodel and repair their houses so they won't seem outdated. Everything in their lives is determined by what everyone else is doing and thinking. You're going to get your guidance in life from one of two sources, either the world or the Word. If you want to know God's will, don't get your cues from the world. The problem today is many people who call themselves Christians automatically accept without whatever the standard the world says is right, even if God says it's wrong. Exodus 23.2 in the New International Version is translated, don't follow the crowd in doing wrong. The majority is seldom right about anything. 1 John 2.17 says, the world and its desires pass away, but the person who does the will of God abides forever. If you're following what most people in the world are doing who are not Christians and they don't have Christian values, I can guarantee you're not following God's will. You can't discover God's will for your life if you're always worried about what other people will think and say about how you live your life. Where do you get your values? Where do you get the guidance for your life? How, what do you base your life on? Well, you might say, well, the Bible. Really? Well, how many minutes a week do you spend reading the Bible? How many minutes a week do you spend on social media or watching television or sitting in front of the computer playing on the Internet? What are, where are you really getting your values? Social media, the, mo the movies, television, they have a tremendous influence on people's lives today. If I called you up and said, now I want you to gather your whole family together. I want you to get your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, and I'm going to come over to your house. And I'm going to tell the most graphic stories about adultery and rape and crime and violence. And I'm going to promote to your family the crassest kind of materialism. Well, you, you, you would never let me come and tell your children and your grandchildren stories like that. But we're happy to let them watch whatever they want to watch on TV, the movies, to tune into whatever ghetto rapper is peddling trash that week on his podcast or his Instagram or in, in his videos. What does it take to make you blush? Is there any point at which you change the channel or you get up and leave the movie or you turn the computer off? What is your limit? We've been so, so totally desensitized that half of our country thinks it's okay for transsexuals to do story time for young children in our schools and public libraries as they confuse them about their own sexuality and groom them for later sexual exploitation. The word for confer, conform that Paul uses when he says don't be conformed is the Greek word from which we get our English word scheme and schizo. It's the word that was used for a Greek actor who would wear a mask and first play a man's part and then switch mask and play a woman's part and then switch mask again and play a good guy and switch mask again and play an evil woman. Schizophrenia is a mental illness in which a person is no, no longer knows what really is, what reality is, or who they are. When we conform to the world, we no longer know what is true and real and genuine. And that pretty well sums up where people in our society are today. They don't know who they are. They don't know what's true and what's false. They don't know what's right and what's wrong. They're not genuine. They're not real. Paul says, don't follow people like that or you're going to become as troubled and as confused as they are. If you want to know God's good, pleasing, and perfect will, first it requires dedication. I need to be totally sold out to Jesus Christ. Secondly, it involves insulation. You don't imitate or isolate, but you learn by God's power to live in the world without letting it influence and control and direct your life. 
Third, knowing God's will involves transformation. Paul writes, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Paul's talking about the Holy Spirit coming and changing us from the inside out, reprogramming our minds with God's truth so we'll know God's will. The word that is translated renewing in that verse is the Greek word from which we get our English word metamorphosis. If you'll let me take this uh, noun and turn it into a verb, God wants to metamorphosize you. He changes the very nature of our mind and personality. Psychologists say that your basic personality is set by the time you're three or four years old. But your personality, your basic way of thinking and acting, the Bible says, can be changed by God. God is in the business of metamorphosis. Thank God I'm not stuck in my past. Thank God I'm not the person I used to be. Maybe you had an especially bad past. Perhaps you were mistreated. Maybe you were sexually abused or physically abused or emotionally abused. Maybe you've been through some traumatic experiences in life or you grew up with so many bad examples around you that you formed a lot of self-destructive or antisocial behaviors. Before I went into the ministry, I was trained in psychology and I can tell you therapy can help you. And it may train you to make better choices or give you strategies for dealing with past traumas, but only God can do a metamorphosis. He created us, and He can re remake us. God says, I can change you from a lowly caterpillar into a beautiful butterfly. You can be free of things that no medication, no therapy could ever free you from. You can fly, but the cocoon has to go. And the cocoon is the old ways, the old habits, the old pattern, the old man or the old woman. Don't be conformed anymore to the standards and values of this world. 1 John 3, 2 tells us what is ultimately going to happen to all those who allow God to transform them. John writes, Dear friends, now we are children of God, and, when we will, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Scripture says one day, when you see Jesus Christ face to face, when He returns or when you go to heaven to be with Him, you're going to be instantly changed to be just like Him. That's the, the ultimate metamorphosis. But now, in the meantime, in 2 Corinthians 3.18, it tells us, And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. We're being changed to be like Christ more and more on a daily basis, little by little right now, if we cooperate with the work of the Holy Spirit, the work that the Spirit wants to do in our lives. What's Paul talking about when he says with unveiled faces? Do you remember when Moses went up on the mountain to get the Ten Commandments? And God, he asked God that if he could see him, and God says, no man can see me and, and live, but, you know, I will cover you as I pass by, and you can see and look and see the back of me. And so Moses gets just a glimpse of God, and when he comes down from the mountain, his face is glowing like a space alien. He's seen God, and he's reflecting the light of his glory. And the people say to Moses, your face is shining so bright, it, it makes us afraid. So Moses had to put a veil over his face. But the Bible tells us eventually the glory faded and Moses didn't want the people to know it was gone, so he kept wearing the veil. Paul says, we don't have to wear a veil as a Christian to keep people from seeing the Lord's glory in our lives. We may not be glowing like space aliens, but when God transforms us, other people will notice. They should notice. The word reflect Paul uses in this verse is the only time this particular Greek word is used in the New Testament. It literally means to contemplate, to look upon, you know, to look at. The more I look at God, the more I focus on Jesus Christ, the more I'm changed to be like Him. You say, well, how do I look at the Lord? Well, through the Bible, through His book, through His Holy Word. As I look at Christ through, through the Bible, as I read more and more about Him, I'm changed. I become more and more like Him. I'm transformed supernaturally by the Holy Spirit working in me that brings the Word of God alive in my life and begins to change me. So Romans 12 tells us the first step to knowing and living out God's will for your life is dedication. Commit yourself totally to Christ. Step two involves insulation. Separate yourself from the values of this world, not physically, but in a spiritual sense. Then step three has to take place, transformation. 
Transformation takes place as you allow the Holy Spirit to work in you as you focus on Jesus Christ and allow His Word and His Spirit to renew your mind. You see, the key to changing your life is to change the way you think. The problem is we can't do that all by ourselves. We have to have the Holy Spirit working in us as we focus on God's written word, the Bible, and God's living word, Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches us the way we think determines the way we feel, and the way we feel determines the way we act. If I'm acting depressed, it's because I'm feeling depressed, and I'm feeling depressed because I'm thinking depressing thoughts. Most people try to change themselves by changing the way they feel or by changing the way they act rather than going to the root of the problem and changing the way they think. You cannot change the way you feel. Feelings don't respond well to commands. Have you ever been a parent that said to a child, stop that crying? Well, you know, that doesn't do any good. You can't command a feeling. Feelings cannot be controlled. But the source of feelings can, and the source of your feelings is the way you're thinking. You can't change the way that you feel, you know, just by commanding it. And it's very hard to change your actions. Example, suppose that you, you have a habit you want to change in your life. Let's just say you want to stop smoking or you want to stop biting your fingernails. Well, imagine that you're on a boat on a lake and the boat is heading east. And this boat is a fancy boat. It has an autopilot. And it's all, the autopilot's been set to direct the boat to go east. Now, if you want to go west, there are two ways you can turn it around. One way is just to grab a hold of the, of the wheel and by sheer willpower and physical strength, fight against the autopilot and turn the wheel till you've turned it around and it's going to the, uh, to the west instead of going to the east. But all the time, the autopilot is fighting against you trying to turn the rudder to the east. That same principle applies to trying to change your life through willpower. You try to force yourself to go in a new direction. That's the opposite way that you've been going for a long time. The whole time you're making yourself do the right thing, you're under tremendous stress and tension because you're fighting your long-time habit, which has become your natural incl inclination or your autopilot. Trying to change through willpower creates a lot of tension and stress, and soon you get tired, you know, of holding onto that steering wheel and fighting the autopilot, and so you let go, and you go off your diet, or you start smoking again. You go back to your old ways that you were trying to change. We can't change the things that are most deeply wrong in our lives by willpower alone. You need God to help you reset the autopilot. What's the autopilot in your life? Well, in your head, complete this sentence. It's just like me to be angry. It's just like me to be self-centered. It's just like me to be insecure or afraid. It's just like me to drink when I'm under stress. You complete that sentence 10 times, and I can tell you what your automatic pilot is. That's the way you see yourself. All throughout Scripture, the Bible teaches, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. All change starts in your thought life. Scripture says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Ephesians talks about putting on the new man. It's talking about putting on a new life in Christ, which includes a new way of thinking. The question then, how do I renew my mind? Psalm 119.9, how can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. The way you change your life is to reprogram your mind with the word of God. The more you fill your life, your mind with God's word, the more your life is transformed as the Holy Spirit brings the word of God alive in your life and reshapes your life, your thinking. A number of years ago, I had a pastor friend who went through a really depressing period in his life, and he just couldn't shake the dark clouds. So he got some little cards, and he wrote some scriptures on them, like Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those in Jesus Christ, or Philippians 4, 19, 
You know, my God will supply all your needs, you know, through Christ Jesus. Or Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He, in other words, he wrote the promises of God on those little cards. And every night before he went to bed, the last thing he did was to pick those cards up and read them. And the next morning before he got out of bed, he'd read through those cards. Three or four times a day, he'd read those cards. He filled his mind with the positive, wonderful promises of God. And gradually as he did that and as he kept taking all of his thoughts to God, in prayer, gradually the clouds lifted. Now, please don't go out of here and tell people that I said all you need if you're depressed is to a few Bible verses. I don't, I, I, I'm not saying that. And you know my background was in psychology. Sometimes it helps to go to counseling. Sometimes it's necessary to take an antidepressant, but an antidepressant is supposed to be a bridge to take you from where you are to where you need to be. And I've got news for you. If you just take the pills and you're not reprogramming your mind, if your mind is not being changed, you're taking a bridge to nowhere. So how do you find God's will for your life? Well, Romans 12, 1 and 2 tells us we find it through the renewing of our minds as we focus on God and His Word. That's why it's essential that you take time to read and study God's Word for yourself throughout the week. As you do that, you need to remember two very important things. First of all, God's will is found in God's Word. Most of God's will for your life, for my life, has been revealed in His Word. As you read through His Word, He speaks to us. And the Holy Spirit applies it specifically. You read a verse that or you, a story that happened in the Bible, and not only do you understand that, but the Holy Spirit is saying to you, so this is what this means right now for you, whether it's a verse or a story. It's been said when you open your Bible, God opens His mouth. When you shut your Bible, God shuts His mouth. I like the motto of the Detroit Bible College, discovering the will of God by studying the Word of God. It's through the principles, commands, and examples of the Scripture that we discover much of God's will for our life. Second, as you search for God's will for your life, remember God will never contradict His Word. God's will never contradicts His Word. People say, I, you know, I've got this impression from God that I should do this or that. And my first reaction is always to ask them, well, what does the Bible say about that? A lot of crazy things get started and false ideas get spread because someone says they have a word from the Lord, a message from God, but it doesn't agree with Scripture. Galatians 1.8 tells us even if an angel comes and tells you some new revelation, if it's contrary to what's in the Bible, don't accept it. It's not God's Word. If someone's personal revelation from God contradicts the Scripture, it's not God's will. It's not, it, it's not God's truth. People over the years have come to me and said, Pastor, I feel this is God's will for my life. And then they try to convince me that God has told them to do something like leave their family, to marry their secretary, or it's okay to be gay, or they have a new revelation that there's another way to God than through Jesus Christ. And I always say, well, your impression isn't from God because the Bible teaches the exact opposite of what you're telling me. But Pastor, it feels so right. You know, the Bible warns us feelings can be very deceptive. The, 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 the uh, uh, Bible tells us the heart is desperately wicked. You know, it, it, it deceives us, our feelings. God will never contradict His Word. The reason a lot of Christians are confused about God's will is they don't know His Word. Why should I care about discovering God's will for my life? Well, Paul gives us a definitive answer. He says God's will is three things. First of all, he says it's good. In Greek, the word that he uses means it's high quality. Now, who doesn't want a high quality life? You want a low quality life? No. God's plan for you is, is the really good life. It's a high quality life. In Jeremiah 29, 11, God says, I know the plans I have for you, plans for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. God's will is exciting. It's fulfilling. It's meaningful. Secondly, it's pleasing or acceptable. You know, a lot of people think God's will is going to be unpleasing or unacceptable to them. They don't understand that God wants the very best for each person's life, not to make them miserable. Some people think, oh, it's easy to know God's will. I just think about what's fun and what I'd like to do, and God's will is just the opposite of that. 
Well, that's a lie. The devil has sold a lot of people for a long time. It's God who wants you to have peace and joy and happiness and a fulfilling life, not the devil. Everything the devil tempts you to do looks like it's the way to happiness, but it never is. Everything the devil has to offer is a counterfeit. It's a lie, and you will always ultimately regret choosing his way. It always ends up hurting you or everyone around you. The Bible says God's will is not only good, it's also pleasing and acceptable. The word translated here as pleasing means satisfying in Greek. God isn't a Scrooge who, when he sees you doing something, you know, having a good time, always says, well, stop that. God wants you to live your life in such a way you don't do things that give a moment of pleasure and then result in years of regret. God's will always shows us the way to long-term joy and peace and happiness and true relationships based on love, not on using each other. God's will is pleasing. It's enjoyable. You will never be any happier than when you're in the center of God's will for your life. And finally, Paul says God's will is perfect. Literally, what this word means is God's plan for your life is tailor-made. It perfectly fits you. It's unique. It's designed for you. It's like a suit or a dress that's been tailor-made. It fits perfectly. It doesn't fit anybody else. It just fits you. It's a custom-fit original. One of the things that getting in the center of God's will for your life does is it releases you from comparison. That's why the Apostle Paul says, don't follow the ways of the world, because how can you follow what everybody else is doing and thinking when God's will is tailor-made for you? If you're doing what everybody else is doing, it's not tailor-made. When you find God's will for your life, you'll have this inner peace, this calmness, this real joy, because it's good for you. It's right for your life. You see, finding God's will isn't as difficult as you probably thought. You just do three things. First, you come to God and you say, I don't want know what you want me to do with the rest of my life, but regardless of what it is, I want to do what you want me to do. I commit myself to you in advance, wholesale, completely, totally. Then you say, Lord, I'm not going to take my cues any longer from what other people say or think or, for the, or from the standards and values of the world or from social media or movies or TV or people or Cosmopolitan magazine. I want to tune into what you have to say. Then God says, well, fill your mind with my word, the Bible, and my spirit will lead you into all truth. As your mind is stayed on me and your mind will be transformed and you will know my good, pleasing and perfect tailor-made will for your life. God says, that's my promise to you. I promise you that God wants you to know his will more than you want to know it. He wants the best for your life. God wants you to grow to the place in your life where you can make decisions just like Jesus would without him having to knock you over the head with a baseball bat or send you a telegram. You'll make the right decisions and you'll go in the right directions because you know the principles of God's word and you've come to understand how his spirit leads, his, leads your life. Psalm 150, the last of the Psalms says, Praise the Lord, praise him in his sanctuary, praise him in his mighty firmament. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise Him because He wants the best for us, because He came into the world and died for us, because He wants to show you a specific, His specific will for your life. The Bible says, you know, that Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane said, I've completed the work you sent me to do. God's got a work for you to do too. And He wants it completed and you will feel complete. You'll find that God's will is perfect for your life, that he's not going to send you off to Africa to be a missionary unless that's what would really make you happy to be in Africa and be a missionary there. God wants what's best for your life, for your family, you know, so seek his will. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word that tells us, Father, how we find your will, how we live out your will for our lives. And Father, I pray that we would hear these words this morning and that we would apply them to our lives in order that we might be all that you've created us to be in Christ Jesus. For we pray these things in his name. Amen.